Hi there. In this video, I wanted to talk about the problems which heteroscedasticity poses and also how we deal with those problems. OK, so let's just refresh our memory of what those two problems are actually in reality. So here I should say that I'm actually assuming that we have exhausted all possible options for this being sort of model heteroscedasticity in that we've included all sort of important emitted variables and we've sort of played around the model, changed the sort of parameters to make it functionally different in a way to sort of try and correct for that heteroscedasticity. And then once we've sort of done all those things and we still have heteroscedasticity, these are the problems which we now face. So I'm not including in this list of problems, for example, that of emitted variable bias. OK, so the first of the problems which one faces with true heteroscedasticity is that the standard errors are, in fact, incorrect. And by that, I mean that the standard errors um, from typical software programs are, in fact, biased. So when I say biased, what exactly do I mean? Well, in reality, they, the sort of statistical software programs, assume that the errors which one faces are homoscedastic. So when we actually have the presence of heteroscedasticity, we're that much less confident in our results in general. So the standard errors which are reported in general will be too small. And because we use these standard errors to calculate our sort of T and F statistics and other statistics which we use for inference, any inference which we use based on, the, or which we conclude based on these standard errors will actually be incorrect. In reality, we will appear to be more confident in our results than we actually should be. So that's a really, really serious issue. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that under the presence of heteroscedastic errors, OLS estimators are no longer blue. In particular, there are other linear unbiased estimators which are better than least squares. So what do I mean by that? So the idea is that if I have some sort of population and I take repeated samples from that population, so I take one sample S1, one sample S2, and I sort of continue doing that, and then on each of those samples, I calculate an estimate of the population parameter beta, or let's call it beta P in the population, and so the first sample, I get an estimate beta um, star one. The second uh, sample, I get an estimate beta star two. And I'm doing this using any particular estimator, which for which OLS is one particular example of an estimator. So if I was to then draw a frequency graph of all of those different estimators, uh, all those different estimates which I got out from applying my estimators to each of those samples, I would get something which we call a sampling distribution. And if we assume that our least squared estimators are still linear and unbiased, then it will turn out that our sampling distribution for least squares will actually be centered around the true population parameter beta p because it's still unbiased. But the problem if we have heteroscedasticity in our model or in our population is that in fact there are other linear unbiased estimators which are better than these squares. And by better, I mean that they are more efficient. So their sampling distribution might be something like this. So this might be the sampling distribution for our new estimator, one of which we call generalized least squares, for which a subset is called weighted least squares. So if I was to use generalized least squares opposed to least squares, if I have heteroscedasticity in my population, then I, because this sort of sampling distribution is that much less wide, yeah, so this second estimator has a sort of lower width of a sort of sampling error than my um, least squares, then if I use generalized least squares, I will get closer to the tube population parameter B to P more often than I would do if I used least squares. Okay, so let's think about how we address each of these problems in turn. So we've already sort of begun to talk about the second one, but I want to go back to it. So the first way in which we can deal with the problems po posed by um, heteroscedasticity is that we can correct the standard errors for the presence of heteroscedasticity. And that's quite simple to do in modern statistical software programs. 
there are sort of various boxes which you can tick, which just do it in a sort of fraction of a second. So one of the ways in which you can address heteroscopic elasticity in terms of taking into account that for the standard errors is to use that which we call white standard errors. And there's also another method which we call the sort of new west standard errors. But I don't want to go into in depth what each of these separate ways of dealing with the standard errors actually do, just to say that there are these two methods. And what these two methods do is they take into account the fact that you have heteroscopic elasticity and then because your standard errors are no longer biased and they're no longer too small, you can still calculate the T and F statistics and those will be then valid for inference. So in a sense, that's quite a good thing because that's the sort of ultimate goal of our model is to use it for inference. But the problem with using this particular method or using the method of adjusting the standard errors is that it's not really addressing the root cause of the problem. It's just addressing one of the sort of actual effects of having heteroscedasticity. Whereas if we address this bottom problem, then we can actually remove heteroscedasticity completely. So one method which I've spoken about already is to use generalized least squares, of which a subset is something which we call weighted least squares. So I don't want to talk about in detail in this video because we're going to cover it in future videos, but essentially what this method does is that it treats each of the different points in your sample slightly differently, depending on the values of independent variables. And by doing that, it essentially allows you to then achieve an estimate of the population parameter or an estimator for the population parameter, which is that much more efficient than these squares. So once we've sort of used generalized least squares on our sample data, our new sort of transform system will have no heteroscedasticity. So that in a way is a very, very good thing because our transform system has homoscedastic errors and we've sort of already addressed this second or the sort of first problem here by addressing the second problem. So in some senses, it's better to use generalized least squares or weighted least squares rather than just correcting the standard errors, which is just a bit of a quick fix. But the problem which the second method has is that it actually relies on us knowing the specific variant structure of the population errors. So an example of a particular variant structure of our population errors u might be that the variance of u given x, our sort of independent variable, is equal to some constant sigma squared times, let's say, x, or let's say x squared perhaps. So this is some sort of functional form which in theory might be going on in our population. But the problem with this particular functional form is that in reality, it's very rare that we actually know truly the variant structure which is going on in our population. So we actually have to estimate that variant structure. And in estimating that variant structure using our existing model, we are in fact gonna have to adapt generalized least squares to take this into account. And when you adapt that particular method, it becomes then known as something which we call the FGLS or feasible generalized least squares. And it's feasible because given the sort of practical constraints which we normally face, we can estimate that particular model. Okay, in the next video, I'm gonna talk about generalized least squares and weighted least squares and the intuition behind what's actually going on in those particular models. I'll see you then.